I do anything else, I want to give you a couple um, comments about exam one. Uh, and I know you're uh, all, uh, uh, you, you were all working very hard to get ready and we're very nervous about it. Let's talk about it. Uh, first of all, the basic specs. Your total grade is the sum of what you got on the Scantron and what you got for clicking. And the clicking question was a four pointer. And I did give partial credit to uh, about a dozen students. So uh, if you had um, zero on the clicking part, it's in your grades page. Uh, that means I graded it and you didn't get any partial credit. If you had a four, that means you got it on the money. Um, and, uh, but if you got three, two, or one, that means I gave you some partial credit for getting, you know, like you missed your powers of 10 somehow. I can, I can tell sometimes just from your answer. Also, I noticed somebody that uh, was trying to type in a decimal point and couldn't find it, and they typed in a bunch of other stuff that didn't, and, and didn't realize what they had, but I said, okay, I'll give it to them. So I can do that with clicking questions versus, you know, in the multiple choice part, the Scantron part, either you have it or you don't. You know, and there were some calculations on there. Um, there was one blooper. Uh, some of you noticed, I, I know a student came up and asked me about it. Uh, one of the problems on one of the tests was, uh, the um, resistors in series, I think, had the wrong value in there uh, compared to the diagram. And uh, because I switched diagrams and I forgot to switch some of the numbers. Um, so what I did with that was um, I gave the students with that blooper, I just gave them all. It's impossible to get the right answer. So I gave it, them all uh, that question for free. So that was a free two points. And then to be fair, I gave everybody else the equivalent question, um, free, uh, free two points. So everybody's, you know, you might have gotten it right um, on, you know, some of the other versions of the test. Uh, but so, but if you got it wrong, then I you benefited from the blooper on, you know, version C or whatever it was that had the blooper. Um, so and that's already in your score. So I did that, I caught it right after lecture, and then, um, now it didn't affect, I noticed that a lot of people were using um, a, a number that was close to the right answer, and it didn't affect your, I, I accepted as correct uh, the other uh, multiple choice questions uh, that um, you could do um, fairly accurately using uh, the blooper value. So so that's all in your score and, and all that's published in your um, web courses grades page. So remember, it's, it's two grades, put them together and they add up to the total. Um, I'll be posting later today, well, tonight, the answer key for each test form. So A, B, C, D and all that. And you have the actual test so you can, you know, uh, and if you, the, the thing is, though, if you did not circle your answer, um, it, you know, I've got it on your Scantron, so it's graded and stuff. But if you didn't circle your answer, um, you know, might not recall what you actually bubbled in. Uh, so uh, try to bubble, try to circle your answers as you go on the next midterms and stuff. Anyway, so that'll be up. And also my solutions for each calculation uh, I'll put up in web courses as well. So the resistors calculation, the uh, electric field calculation from the diagram, uh, and that's actually the clicker calculation, and then the voltage calculation, although the voltage uh, should have been fairly elementary. Uh, and, uh, but I'll do the, um, so the, put those solutions up as a PDF. I'm still trying to figure out somewhere I can get the special ink for my, my smart pen. Uh, so I'm, I'm paralyzed with, without that. So I, so I can't do a talking PDF the way I like to do, but a regular static PDF is, is, uh, is coming up. We'll do that tonight. 
Uh, keep the exam as a mini study guide for the final. And um, it's now that you know what my exams are like, you know, which, you know, before the test, nobody knew what they were like. Uh, uh, you can, you know, adjust your study procedures. And remember, on the three midterms that we have, um, we drop the lowest exam and we keep the best two. So for many of you, it'll be exam one. And it's not just this class. It's most of my classes, you know, everybody's always nervous. They don't know what to think. You know, and they, they for many students, not, not all of them, but for a good fraction, exam one is always the one that gets dropped. Because the students, and I hope this applies to everyone in here that did not get a, a good high grade. Uh, by the way, the average was a C. I mean, if, I don't give letter grades on tests and stuff, but it was a C average, so. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so you keep the, the best two out of three scores. And for many students, that happens to be the, the... Now, some of you will did good on this one, and you might bloop it up on exam two. Well, then that's the one that we drop. You know, but what I found, every semester in most of my classes, astronomy, physical science, you know, physics 2048, the, the first exam, students are A, really nervous, and B, they don't know what to expect. They think they know what to expect, but they don't know until they get to test. So a lot of people get tripped up on it. But then they adjust their study methods, and I've already talked to some of you about that. Um, and they adjust their study methods. They now know a little bit more about my Wiley tricks, uh, my Wiley strategies on exams, and they start crushing them. And I never know who it is going to be, but I know that it's, it's going to be a bunch of yous. You're going to start crushing my exams. And so what that means is that exam two and exam three, you're going to do better and hopefully better on exam three than you did on exam two. And then those are the two that we keep. And then we drop exam one. And that happens for a lot of students in, in all my classes. So um, if you feel like you biffed it on this one, you know, we got one to burn. And for many students, many semesters, this is the one that gets burned. So, so just make... Uh, just take the attitude that you're going to maybe uh, study a little differently or follow my instructions for studying um, and uh, study with a friend, study with a study partner, um, come to office hours and stuff. By the way, office hours are going to be Wednesday this week, and they're going to be in room 158 in the Physical Sciences Building, as I announced last week. Uh, so, so that'll be good. And uh, it's a little different room. There's no coffee. There's no little donuts and bagels and things. But it's, you know, it's good. It's comfortable chairs and plenty of sp space. And we'll just study on, we'll work on problems and stuff. So that'll be Wednesday. And then, and actually that's good because Thursday you have your written problem. Oh, by the way, the written problem is not finished grading. So we'll get that done and, and back to you tomorrow. So don't worry about that. Um, so uh, off hours Wednesday, and uh, from 12, 15, 12.30-ish in there, and my office is just two doors down, so if I'm not there at 12.15, I'll be there 12.30, and you can come and knock on my door and see if you can persuade me to get out of my office. My regular office is room 156. My office hours office is room 158. Uh, okay. Any other questions pertaining to that or to the previous half, the first half of lecture? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, a particle in a magnetic field, if it's a uniform magnetic field, it'll just go around in a circle, it's, or it might spiral, 
you know. <coughs> and, but its speed will never change if the field is mag if the field is uniform. If it's non-uniform, you you know, like the the magnetic field lines for a bar magnet, the dipole field. Um, what happens there is it might start to really spiral tightly because as it gets closer to the bar magnet or as it gets closer to the north pole of the earth, yes, the aurora borealis, the northern lights, is produced by charged particles trapped in the magnetic field of the earth, spiraling around the field lines getting accelerated and producing light, all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. And they're also colliding with particles in the atmosphere. And so it's, but that only happens where the magnetic field lines become less uniform and tighter and tighter and tighter. That means stronger and stronger because the tighter the magnetic field lines, the stronger the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the bigger the force, bigger magnetic, bigger centripetal force means tighter radius. So it gets smaller and smaller. Uh, so it'll start with a big spiral and then start really, you know, circling around. So <coughs> what happens, the other thing that happens is any, any accelerating charge will emit electromagnetic radiation, entire spectrum of radiation from infrared all the way up into possibly into ultraviolet or x-rays if they're spiraling fast enough. If you go to the doctor's office um, and get an x-ray, you know, like, you, you know, on your, your knee or something like that, and they have that, or you, even in the dentist's office, they have a machine, you know, they, they put this thing in your mouth in the dentist's office and then, you know, they put you in a cage and they, you know, you got to sit perfectly still and everything. And then they turn on some music to distract you. And then they turn on the machine. And the machine is basically accelerating charges in a way that direct a very tight beam of x-rays right where they point it, you know, by your, where your teeth is or where your, where your knee is. And so that's another example of uh, what happens in a uniform and in a non-uniform magnetic field. Continue your question. Uniform electric or magnetic field? Yeah, if if your if your force if you're not ex if you're um, if you have a little bit of velocity that's not um, that's along the magnetic field, for instance. So you, the B field is like this, and you're slanting into it a little bit. That means you're gonna you're gonna spiral like this. You know, spiral. You, the, a magnetic charge, or excuse me, an electrical charge is going to effectively spiral around, or can spiral around, a, 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 or circle a field line. And if it's got a little bit of velocity along the field line, you know, see so if you send it in a slant, it'll still, it'll still circle the field line, but it'll still keep going upward, and that'll turn it into a spiral. So. Possibly, yeah. Depends on the, yeah, because the, if the magnet, if it's non-uniform, that means in one place it's stronger, and in another place it's weaker. So it goes from weak to, to strong, then it gets a tighter spiral, more field lines. What is your name again? Tatiana. Tatiana, Tatiana just asked a grad, physics grad student question. Because the emission of radiation will change the energy state of the charged particle, okay? And that does, so that, 
so the speed is changed. Things are changing. It's it's not it's not pumpkin pie. You know, it, it's not easy. It's very difficult. That's that's a grad student level or higher question. But yeah, in 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 uh, when it as it emits radiation. <coughs> excuse me. I have a horrible cold. Um, as it emits radiation, it it will lose energy. You know, so the field will lose energy. It's very complex, but yeah, you, you got to. There's a huge amount of things you got to keep track of and calculus and trig out the wazoo. So it's, but the, and so so Tatiana, here's one 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 way to think about it. What we're gonna do in this class, we're pr the the. The most complicated we're going to get is a solenoid field, which I already showed you the coil. Looks like a dipole field, bar magnet field, and a uniform field. Okay? And we're going to do some, some tricks with a uniform field and parallel charge plates. Um, but other than, we're going to keep to very simple systems. So the symbols that we de deal with in chapter 21 are going to be really simple. But to get much, much fancier than what we're going to look at, you got to be a grad student or higher. And, they, you know, they got down in Los Alamos, you know, they got a third of the PhDs on the planet down there figuring out stuff exactly like that to protect our satellites in orbit and stuff like that. It's a big program. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay, the question is, what does it mean to be a magnet? What it means to be a magnet is to be a piece of matter that has a lot of moving charges that are oriented close to the same direction. Now, in a regular piece of iron, the ele iron is the most magnetic material simply because the, the nature of the atomic orbitals, the shapes and stuff. But in normal iron, that they pour, you know, out of a, you know, at a steel mill. You know, steel is mostly iron. And those iron atoms, they're all oriented topsy-turvy in all di different directions. But if you, if you let those iron molecules cool, or the steel mixture cool, right next to a gigantic magnetic field, or inside of a gigantic magnetic field, it'll, it'll all be magnetized. All the iron atoms will be lined up more or less in the direction of the magnetic field or possibly opposite the magnetic field. So that's what it means to be a, a magnetic. It means to, to have a bunch of currents, the electrons in the iron, molecule, iron atoms, oriented close to being in unison. It's not, it's not possible to get every, well, it's possible to get like a coil and everything's in unison because you've got a fairly good, well-contained current. But other than that, it, you know, in a real piece of iron. And here's an interesting story that I'll share with you about iron. <coughs> when I was in grad school, they built a new physics building in, out, out at my, uh, my school. And we finally got in there. They, they, they brought all the physics profs and the grad students over there. And, we all had our own office. And we were in this big office, you know, like a, eight grad students in there, little cubby holes and stuff. And um, I was a TA, and we, were, we had a, a magnetic uh, a lab, you know, with the, the lab that I was TAing for. Uh, was, we were doing magnets, so I brought in a magnet, and I was fooling around with it. Or I brought in a, my, one of my compasses from hiking. And, you know, I was fooling around with some of the magnets from the lab and stuff. And, and as I brought it into my office, I was, I was checking, okay, which direction is, is, the, is the corridor of that physics building? Is it, is it due north or is it 
slightly off from north or you know what I wanted to find that out so I'm, I'm carrying my compass down the hallway right and I go into my office and I'm watching my compass needle and as I went into my office the compass needle went from here to there it turned it turned into like a circle as I walked through my do the door of the office and I said what the heck? So, and I, so I went back and tried it again. And, it, you know, every time I would go through there and I, I asked one of the guys, I said, what's what's with this external, this extraneous magnetic field? And what I, what they were they pointed out to me was there is a big pillar there, a big piling. They put these big steel girders that, with a big pile driver. And they and I remember in from the old building, we could hear them building the new building. And they had this big pile driver with these big steel girders just pounding them into the ground, you know, to, to build this, you know, to build the, the rest of the building around. So it'd be ultra stable, you know, for a science lab, you need ultra stability. So they were doing that. But as they did that, what they, what they did was they, they, they jiggled all the iron atoms in those pilings. And it wasn't melting it. But it was just enough so that when they stopped pounding it, they all oriented to the magnetic field of the earth. And that is something, and I later found out that like when the Navy builds a ship in a shipyard with iron, they have to magnetically, they have to demagnetize the entire ship because all the pounding, the riveting and the welding and stuff uh, of a steel ship, no matter where you are on the earth, it's going to be magnetized by, you know, by the magnetic field in the shipyard, you know, because you're not going to be moving that much while you're under construction. So, um, you know, that, so that's, that's what it means to be a piece of iron. You can be, you can be re-magnetized, uh, by, by that kind of pounding. Now, I want to go and get further into chapter 20. So, <clears throat> this is the thing that I want to focus on. The time evolution of charge in a simple capacitor circuit. Now, this is, go, this is a very short section, but for you guys, it's an important section, 20.13. Because a capacitor is a part of a lot of devices that you'll want to at least have some specific knowledge of, like a heart pacemaker. The capacitance, I looked up a few uh, pacemakers, and yeah, they have a capacitance of a few micro coulombs, that Greek letter mu is the symbol for micro, 10 to the minus six. Yeah, they have a, um, a capacitance of a few micro coulombs per volt. And remember, a coulomb per volt um, is the unit of capacitance. It's also known as the farad, after Michael Faraday. And a, a capacitor that has a cap capacitance of one farad is ginormous. Um, so a microfarad is much more uh, human scale. Um, anyway, so here's a picture uh, see those kind of orangey brown things right up here? Yeah, those are um, those are uh, capacitors from the AVX company. I looked it up on the internets. Um, the HRC 500 TBC, that's a series of capacitors, and they're specially made ultra precise for pacemakers and other medical devices. And the range, <coughs> excuse me, the range for the capacitance of that um, line uh, from the AVX company is 0 0.47 microfarads up to about 47 microfarads. So, uh, so let's study. I mean, it's, it's worth, everybody in here is, is interested in med school and medical uh, activity, yeah. Let's take a look at circuits. Now, here's the simple circuit we're just going to study. It's a circuit, so it's going to have some resistance. 
And we're putting all the resistance of the battery and the capacitor into the big R and, and the wire. It's all in the big R. So it's symbol of all the resistance. And it has a voltage V, you know, so like a six volt battery. And then this, the schematic symbol for a capacitor is uh, two parallel lines of the same size. For a, for a battery, it's two parallel lines, one shorter than the other. Okay, and the, the long one on the battery is the positive side. So the uphill side of the capacitor is also the positive side of the capacitor. And that's important if you're charging up the capacitor. That's the plate that becomes positive. Okay, and what the so we think of it as conventional uh, conventional current as positive charges being deposited. Now, physically, what happens? Electrons get stripped out of there. Okay, it becomes positive because of that the physical current. Now, here is the um, equation. Uh, that represents the voltage source V in the battery and the fact that the IR voltage drop plus whatever is loaded into the capacitor, which is 1 over C times Q, whatever the Q is of the capacitor, you know, if it's one, one electron or 9,000 or some other big number. You know, that's the, that's the voltage state, all right? So V equals I over R. Oh, and by the way, get your clickers out because we have a clicker question coming up in just a minute. Now, what we're going to study, we're not going to study this one directly. The one that we're going to study directly is this circuit. It's a little bit simpler. We take the battery out. We charge it up, you know, so many uh, coulombs of charge, and then we take the battery out and let it discharge. Okay, so what happens is the work gets done in the resistor as it flows back around counterclockwise manner, and all those positives flow around through the resistor and back around to the negative side. And when that is finished, the charge load on the capacitor is zero, all right? And the, the capacitor has done all the work that it can do at the resistor. You know, so whatever the resistor is, you know, a light bulb or a motor or something like that, this is, that's where the work gets done, all right? Now, uh, what I, the, f the first clicker question that I want to work with you on is um, the kind of equations that represent these two processes. All right, so quick clicker question. Number one, is this, which equation represents the discharging RC circuit? Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, let me see what you guys voted for. Um. Yeah, this is the right one. Uh, A is correct because this means your battery is out. You, you've taken the battery out of the circuit. So if you, if you answered B, just make sure that you make a note of why this is the correct. Now, we're going to go back to the original form here, and we're going to do something to it, and then we're going to take out the battery. All right, so make a note of this. Here we go. Here's the original one. V equals IR plus 1 over C, 1 over the capacitance, times the charge state. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is modify the current 
And this is definitely kosher. Delta Q over delta T. Go ahead and write that down instead of, the, instead of capital I. All right. And let's make that modification. It's, it's certainly kosher to do that. You know, the change in the charge at a point in the circuit, how much goes past a certain point per unit time. That's what that is, delta Q over delta T. Okay, and then now we're going to disconnect the battery. All right, and we're going to let the energy dissipate at the resistor. So now we're going to use this version. And now you're going to see why I want to study the discharging circuit first with the zero over there. It's a little bit easier to see everything that's happening. All right, because this formula, if you get Q by itself, uh, go ahead and clear that other stuff over to the other side. Get Q by itself. Go ahead and take a second to do that. Is this what you've got? Q equals minus RC times delta Q over delta T. Do you have that? Because that's really important. That's a really important equation for us. And I'm going to spend some time talking with you about that. And let's just make an observation uh, about this. First of all, there's this mysterious combination of two circuit parameters, the resistance and the capacitance, RC. Okay, now RC, if you look at the units of RC, whatever it is, you know, five times seven or, you know, five ohms times seven farads or whatever it happens to be, um, the R is volts per amp or volts per coulomb per second, all right? And then the capacitance is coulombs per volt. You know, how many coulombs do you get in per volt of battery juice? You know, and that's what the capacitance is. That's what a farad is, anyways. And notice here, anybody notice anything about that? Cancellation, cancel your volts. And we got that Coulomb in the denominator and one in the top, so cancel your Coulombs. You know, so write them out and then draw a line through them. And now that, se that per second is the only thing that you can't cancel and it's in the denominator. So the denominator of a denominator is, well, the denominator of this denominator is seconds. So the unit of RC is seconds. Yeah, man, don't, don't squinch your face up. It's seconds. No, don't look over there. I'm looking right at you. Yeah, okay, now you're smiling. Oh, okay. Got to move up to the front or get your binox. Anyways, yeah, so, the, so this little per second down here, let me get my cursor over there. Here we go. Okay, this little per second down here, boop, it flips up and it's now in the numerator and everything else is gone. So it's the only thing in the numerator and there is no denominator. So the unit of RC is seconds. My wonderful students, this is called the RC time constant. The symbol for it is Greek letter tau, lowercase. Another thing I want to point out to you is that the minus sign uh, is important. All right now, I'm going to give you another clicker question here, and I want you to give your best educated guess on this next question. So Dominic, make sure you're wide awake. All right, here we go. Make an educated guess about the minus sign, i.e. the minus sign dot, dot, dot. What does it mean? 
And just take a minute. Oh, let me start the question for you. Okay. Type in your... The significance of the minus sign. What does it mean? By the way, if you can't make office hours on Wednesdays after lunch and before lecture, I still am here after lecture every day, so I never, let, I never kick anybody out. So think, my wonderful students, think. So far, nobody is. Well, I'll show you the answers here in a minute. Okay, 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let me show you what the selection of answers is. It's kind of interesting here. I want you to look at this. Okay, there's a fairly good distribution here. Uh, no majority opinion. B seems to be popular, but A and C are also popular. Uh, somebody voted for D, one person, 13 for E. <coughs> Let's take a look. Uh, let me switch back to this. And uh, let's, a let's ask this. <coughs> Does the current change direction? The answer to that is no. It's all always going from the positive through the resistor and back around to the negative side. So that, until it's completely discharged. And then there's no current, because you know, it's neutralized. So that one's out, physically that one's out. Signifies the decreasing charge load. Well, we know the charge load on the capacitor is getting smaller. All right, so that's a possibility, that's a maybe. C, encodes the nature of moving charges, i.e. electrons. Uh, no, not really. Because all that is encoded in the in the cues, the, you know whatever is moving. I mean, it, really, it's it's the same for if if it were if it were minuses, if it were electrons moving, it'd be the same equation. Because my and minus sign on both sides would cancel out. So it, so C is out. Uh, scientific notation? No, there's no scientific notation in that one. Uh, e, overrides the voltage of the battery, thereby creating a backwards potential. Uh, is gobbledygook. Uh, I, although, I'm, I'm sorry to say, 13 students fell for that one. Uh, that one is just kind of tempting, tempting you with something that sounds scientific but isn't. There's no battery in it, so, so how can it, if there's no battery on the circuit, how can you reverse its voltage? So B is the correct answer on that one. And let's take a look at it. Here's the equation, okay? And what I wanna draw your attention to in this is the following. That delta Q over delta T, and this, so this is just the, the inverse of the other equation. Delta Q over delta T is equal to a constant, one over RC, so one over tau, um, with a minus sign in front, times the charge itself. All right, now that is a fundamental significance. 
Make sure you write that equation down. Delta Q over delta T, the time rate of change of the charge on the capacitor is proportional to the charge on the capacitor itself. So the more charge you have in the capacitor, the more the, ch the, the uh, charge load is changing, the more delta Q you get per second or per millisecond. All right, now, that is an example of this basic structure. The physical systems that have an amount N that's proportional to the rate of change of N. And you may be thinking to yourself, Dr. B, what the heck are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about radioactive decay, for instance, radium. The more radium atoms you have, the more radioactive decay you have. Okay, so um, the higher the rate of decay. So, you know, if you have a Geiger counter and you have an ounce of radium, which is a lot, you're going to get a lot more clicks in your Geiger counter than if you only have a half an ounce because there's fewer of them. And the thing about uranium is in every second of time, a certain proportion of however many you have will decay. For instance, and you, know, and you can use any you know, um, uh, duration of time that you like, you know, a certain proportion per second, certain proportion per day, certain proportion per year. And for radium, what they figure is that in 1,600 years approximately, half of your radium is going to decay if it's radium-226, which is one of the isotopes of radium. It's one of the radioactive isotopes. And actually, I think all the, radio, uh, all the isotopes of radium are radioactive. How do we get radium? It's a decay product of uranium. Uranium ore, will, the uranium will de eventually decay into radium, and then that'll live, um, you know, a few hundred years, and, uh, or a few days. Some, some isotopes of radium are even more unstable. This is the most stable one. So we call that the half-life. The half-life of radium is 226. Now, the time constant of radium, you know, I should have done that. I should have figured out the time constant. Radium doesn't have resistance and capacitance. It's an atom. It's a radioactive system. So we don't really call it an RC time constant, but it does have a time constant. Um, and I'll show you exactly where that comes in. It also has a half-life. You know, the, the amount of time it takes to decay by a half. So if you have a 1,000... Uh, atoms of radium in your sample in 1600 years uh, 500 of them will have decayed and you'll be left with and they'll what they'll decay into is usually radon radon gas and then that is emitted into the atmosphere and stuff um, so that's a physical system where the change the time rate of change is proportional to the amount that you have. N is proportional to delta N over delta T. Now, here's another system that, for which that is true. And some of you may have studied this if you've ever had biology class. Yeah, biological populations. You know, predator and prey. And, and you know, and, and a real population is not exactly uh, like this but it's close, it's a good approximation. So, so guys that are studying, you know, the population of uh, salmon in uh, Bristol Bay in the Pacific Ocean, yeah, they might be using formulas like this. Uh, RC circuits, yeah, we, we, we just talked about that. And there are many other physical systems in which the quantity the change in the quantity is proportional to the quantity itself. And believe it or not, students, this is also, if you've ever heard of the word fractals, F-A-R-C-T-A-L, this is very similar to the idea of fractals, which is concerned with self-similarity, uh, which I'd love to teach you about, but I only get to mention it for 20 seconds. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do a real example with a real capacitor that I looked up on the internet uh, from an auto, not a not a pacemaker capacitor, but an automotive capacitor. Uh, and we're going to look at a spreadsheet and figure out the charge load and then the current uh, using uh, that equation. All right. Delta Q over delta T uh, equals uh, 1 over RC times Q, negative 1 over RC times Q. All right. So, um, so what I did was I looked up some Samsung automotive capacitors. Here's the lineup. That's, this is their web page. All right. They actually call it the lineup. All right. So you can see here, you know, you look at this, there's a capacitor. There's capacity. So some of these they have a capacity in picofarads. And then these ones down over here, uh, nanofarads. All right. And here's another part of the lineup, the X7R. So these are probably ones that go into any kind of automobile built in Korea. Probably other places too. All right, so the one that we're gonna study is this one. Bing, 063-1608, good old 1608. And look at the ratings on this thing. Let's get a little closer here. We got a 25 volt max, the rated voltage for 1608, <coughs> good old 1608 is 25 volts max, okay? So they say don't use it for systems above 25 volts. All right? Yeah, we can, we can deal with that. And the, the rated capacitance is one microfarad. So that's one times 10 to the minus six farads. Go ahead and write that down because you're gonna need it to calculate. Yeah, you got another clicker question. Coming up. Matter of fact, did you write down your specs there? 25 volt max, one microfarad rating for good old 1608. Here's your next question. That's all right, I got it written on the next page. What's the maximum charge load? Here we go. Let me start this question. There are the specs for you. But you might want to use scientific notation so, I guess I just gave away the question. Good going, Dr. B. Thirty seconds. Thou hast two numbers to multiply. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. What? Did I, I miscount it? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Lift off. I see a bunch of people changing their answers. That's interesting. Well, it looks like the, the last two, uh, D, C and D, were popular. Let's take a look at what we got here. 0 0.000025 coulombs. Volts cancel. D is the answer. <laughs> got a, two numbers. I mean, you can. So here's what we're going to do. Shh, shh, shh. Let's, let's finish up strong here. Got a few more minutes left. We're going to start, I want you to write down this strategy. We're going to start with our um, charge at time zero, 
completely loaded. 0.000025 coulombs. All right? 25 micro coulombs. And then what we're going to use, do is we're going to use our equation to calculate delta Q after a tenth of a second. And then we're going to remove that much delta Q from the capacitor, send it through the wire and all around to the other side. And that's going to give us Q1 or the, the next Q. And then we're going to repeat that about 50 times. So write down this strategy. There's your strategy. And here's what the spreadsheet looks like. Um, I'll just give you a, an eyeball of it. And you can see, like up here is the time constant, 0 0.1. And uh, students, by the way, I, I put the, the resistance at 100,000. Now, you don't have to worry about that. It's on the, it's on the YouTube or it will be in a few minutes. Anyways, this is what it looks like. You know, you figure out, so here's my column. Here's Q as a function of time. I start with 25 microcoulombs, and then here's my, here's my delta Q, and here's my delta Q over delta T, and then I just work it on all the way down, and here's what it looks like. Draw a graph of this. Much better graph than they have in the textbook. Now, this one, I, I extended the time axis by a factor of 10, so it didn't look too uh, squished up. It starts up here at 2.25 times 10 to the minus 5, and it goes pretty close to 0 after about 4 after about 40 iterations, all right? Now, here's the halfway point, 1.125, all right? That's the halfway level. This, this time here is known as the half-life, okay? So kind of estimate the halfway point and then drop down to the time axis. That's the, the half-life. Now, this one over here is the time constant. Um, when the, when the, ch we're not done. We're not even close to being done. Okay, so don't, don't get, don't pack up your stuff. We'll be done in a, in a minute or two, but we're not done yet. The time constant, the, the half-life tells how long does it take to get down a half gone. The time constant, tau, tells you how long does it get down to 1 over e. All right, and that's this proportion down here. All right, so right here, this is the half-life. And then right here, this is the time constant. And it's a little bit off. It should be right here at 1, uh, because remember, this is the time multiplied by 10. So it looks like a nice graph. Um, so my, my graph is, is fairly good. It's a little bit sloppy, but it's not precise. But it's, it's good enough for government work. Now, that's the discharge curve. All right, now I hope you have a good um, graph of this. The loading curve would be just the upside down version of that. Here's what that would look like. All right? There's the loading curve. Now, both of these curves are in chapter 21. And here is the exact equation. If I graphed this one, I would have I, my graph would be perfect. It wouldn't be but I was using delta T's and all that stuff, so it wasn't quite perfect, but this is perfect. Exponential decay. In the first one, you can see the original charge, Q of zero. 25 microcoulombs is what we used. And then e to the minus T over RC. 
Another way to write it is e to the minus t over tau with the time constant. And that, my wonderful students, is important for us in this chapter and in chapter 21 and 22. And we will get down to that business uh, on Tuesday. Uh, for homework, just read into chapter 21. You're dismissed. 452.